Well, good morning, Southeast. I am glad that you're here. Whether you're here in the building or you're watching online, you are welcome at Southeast Christian Church. I'd love to meet you if you are here in the building. I will be out on the red carpet. We roll out our red carpet for our guests, and uh, following the service, I'll be out there. I'd love to shake your hand. If you're watching online, you can email me directly at mike at southeast.cc. Love to hear from you. Um, Hey, before we get started, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. God, we thank you for the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you be with us as we study your word, that you would shape us, that we would be conformed to your image, the image of Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. If you are new with us, we are going through the book of Ephesians. This is a letter written to the church in Ephesus. It was written while Paul, the Apostle Paul, was in prison. He was in a Roman prison. He had a guard chained to him 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. As he was writing to them, he had heard about their faith. He had heard about their steadfastness. And he said that he wanted to tell them about it. But he also wanted to instruct them in how to live. They were this small congregation. And and they were in this city where a temple dominated the skyline. It was the temple of Artemis. It was a temple that was focused on money and sex. And he was writing to them and he was saying, look, you are small in number, but Christ is bigger. You are small in number, but Christ is bigger. And if you are going to make a difference in this world, if you are going to make a difference in this culture, you need to hold on to who Christ says you are. Don't let go of that. And so he spends the first three chapters of the book reminding the church in Ephesus who they are in Christ. And he kind of bookends it with two prayers. Prayers that they would be strategically thinking about how God would use them in this culture that is opposite, that is against him. And so we turn to chapter 4 and it begins to get practical. That's how Paul writes most of his books as he writes the first half as this is who you are in Christ These are the promises that we hold on to, and so here's how we apply that to everyday life. And so we made that turn uh, last week, and and today we're going to pick it up again. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 17. But as you're turning there, here's what he said last week. He said this, the church, if you're going to make a difference, if we're living in the shadow of the temple, if you're going to be a difference, here is what God has set up, that you are the church, that you are one in unity, that you are diverse in function, that we all have different roles, and that we are being built up in love, the the body of Christ ministering to the body of Christ, building itself up in love. Like it is unique. And today he turns and he says, the, if, if the first few chapters were of the church, this he gets down to you and me, the individual. So if the, the church is the mechanism for making a difference, for, for proclaiming the kingdom, for proclaiming the gospel, he says, this is what God is doing in you. This is his work in you. And so I want to remind you, as you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, a lot of times what happens is we we come to church and we think, oh, yeah, I I have a lot of bad in my life. And so if I can come to church, and I'll add a little bit of good in my life, and then that will even the scales. And that's not how it works. That's not the goal. The goal is that you and I become like Christ. You see, when we surrender our life to Christ, when you you shout, God, I need you, I need a Savior, I am a sinner, when you repent, when you confess, when you are buried with Christ in baptism, when you are resurrected to walk in new life, when God seals you with the Holy Spirit, He marks you, you are His. 
And what happens then is that in that moment, you are justified. You are declared innocent. You are a new creation in him. But here's the problem. You and I still wrestle with the flesh. That's why, again, you, we can come to church and we can shout and we can praise and we can, we can praise. And immediately after going to a church service, we can walk out the door and cut off the person in front of us on the freeway and flip off the person in line at Chick-fil-A. Now, there's two jokes there because Chick-fil-A is not open on Sundays. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that Dan Cathy is going to have to answer for that <laughs> when he gets... <laughs> but, but here's the thing. We wrestle with it, and our hope is that at some point, God's going to heal our flesh. At some point, God is going to redeem our flesh. That's what we hope in. So we have this gap between the time that we're saved and the time where all things are made new. And we have the Holy Spirit working inside of us. And what the Bible calls this, it's this word called sanctification. Where He's cleansing you. He's making you become more like Him. That we will reflect the image of Christ. In everything that we do. That's the goal. That we reflect Christ in our marriages. That the new man that God has made inside of each of you. That he is becoming more and more like Christ. In everything that they do. I had a person come up to me. And, and maybe you've heard this. And I cringe every time that I hear this because it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what Christ is doing in your life. Here's, maybe you have heard this. Where somebody will say, you know, I, I don't really know. I mean, I believe that Christ rose from the grave. But even if, even if he didn't, and we get up to heaven or we get up and it, and it ends, and it's like, well, at least you've lived a good life. And I said, that's contrary to Scripture. That's not what Paul says. Paul writes to another church. This is in Corinth. And Corinth was a mess. It was a church that was just, you know, Christians gone wild. And, and, and here's what happens. He begins to write to them and he says, hey, here's what happens. Here's, you know, chapter 15. We have hope. Death will be, concert, will, will be conquered. We have victory in Christ. But in those verses, in chapter 15, he says this. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we, have our, we are, of all people, must be pitied. You see, when you surrender your life to Christ, you're His. And he begins that transforming work in your life. He begins that transforming work in your heart. He begins to sanctify you. He begins to make you more and more and more like Christ. That's what Christianity is all about. That you and I are being made into a new creation. And so if we, if we have this view of, well, we did a little bit of good. We've missed the point. Folks, there are good people who are going to hell. There are people who have done great, extraordinary things. But they've never identified their life with Christ. No, 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 no. Our hope is that we are going to be raised with Him. Or as Paul says, we are most to be pitied. And so that's what Paul gets to in Ephesians chapter 4 as he's writing to this congregation. He says there's the church, one in unity, diverse in function, and built up in love. And then he looks at the parishioner, he looks at the congregation, he looks at the member of the body, and he says this is what God is doing in your life for every believer. And I recognize that there are people who are in this room who have never surrendered your life to Christ. 
And I recognize that there are people who are watching online who have never surrendered their life to Christ. And I'm going to be talking primarily to the people who have surrendered their life to Christ. To the people who have said, yes, I need a Savior. But I would like to point out that if you've never done that, this is what we're, this is the game, this is the goal, this is the aim, that we become more like Jesus. And this is the process of how Christ is doing that in a believer's life. And so he starts, he begins, verse 17, 17, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. The temple that dots the skyline, the temple that focuses on sexuality, the temple that focuses on money, the, the temple that focuses on power, when you walked with that culture, when you walked in that, in that realm, you were in the futility of your mind. It was all worthless. It was all pointless. There was, there was no hope. And he says, as you come to Christ, don't keep walking in those ways. You are different. You have been sealed. You have been adopted. You have been forgiven. You have been lavished grace. You have been sealed with His Spirit. Don't keep walking as though you have never surrendered your life to Christ. That's what he's saying. He's he's saying you're different. I understand that, that this temple dominates the skyline. I understand that you're in the shadow of the temple. But your goal is not to line up with your former life. So as we step forward in Christ, there should be a conflict that happens within our families, at our work, in our schools. Because you are different. You have been called. And here he explains it. He says they have been darkened in their understanding. They have been alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves to sensuality, greed to practice of every kind of impurity. Notice what it says. It's the ignorance, but it was a hardness of their heart. It was a direction that they were going. It was a direction that was not focused on God. It was a, it was a direction that was not open to, to God. And what happens then is that when we get into that moment, there's usually two, two directions that you can go. And, and one is this, is that you become self-conceited. That you become arrogant. That you kind of put yourself on a pedestal that says, well, I know everybody, I know better than everybody else. And what happens then in that moment is that you begin to judge, not based on scripture, not based on anything else, but based on your own level of holiness or whatever it is. And the problem is, is that if you have that view, if you are stepped, if you are in that view, if you are in that moment, here's the problem. Nobody can live up to your expectations. Anybody ever been on a comment section on social media? No, only me? Okay. The other option is to say, you know what, whatever goes unbridled, given over to your sensuality. Here's here's the problem. Have you ever given over to your flesh? Your flesh will never be satisfied. It leads to death. It can't it, you cannot ever satisfy satisfy your flesh, whether it's in power, whether it's in sex, whether it's in money. It will never be gratified. It just continues deeper and deeper and deeper and, and longer. And, and as to put it this way, your sin will always take you farther than you wanted to go. And it will cost you more than you ever wanted 
more than you were ever willing to pay. And Paul writes and he says that the, this group who, who they once were, that they're greedily looking for ways to indulge. It's never enough. So he describes this old life that the, that the people of the church of Ephesus used to have. And then he says, but that's not you. That's not you. You're different. Remember? Look at this. But that is not the way that you learned Christ. Wendy also makes a point on this, on this, and I want to share it with you. She says this, The wording of this phrase is especially noteworthy. It is not that I have simply learned about Christ along with the other things, but that Christ himself is the sum and substance of all God is teaching us. Christ himself is the catechism. Christ is God's doctrinal statement. It's Christ. And and so when we look at Jesus' life, here's what he says. Look at this. And some of you can identify with this. In Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, here's what it says. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am lowly and gentle in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Are any of you tired? And just exhausted? And just wondering how you're not, not even how to get through next week, but how to get through today. This is what Jesus is saying, but what, when he's saying that, he's saying, take all of me. The, the yoke was a bar or a frame of wood by which the two draft animals, like the, the ox, are joined at the head or the neck in order to work together effectively in pulling a plow or a wagon. It was the yoke. And we know that from looking at at farmers and how they they plowed their fields and and that type of stuff. But but here's the thing is that this was also in in Judaism. This was kind of a rabbi's yoke. If a person wanted to follow a rabbi, they would take his yoke upon him. Which meant that he was taking, he or she she was taking his his teaching from from Luis Isaac Rabonet, Rabonet, in, in, rabbi, in rabbinic theology, the yoke is a metaphor of great importance. It is the symbol of service and servitude in accordance with the principle that the Jew should be free from servitude to, main, to, to man in order to devote himself to the service of God. In other words, if you were going to follow a rabbi, you would, you would free yourself from all the other distractions that you would have. You would free yourself from all of the worldly things that you have so that you could devote himself to the service of God. The yoke of the kingdom of man is contrasted with the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. The doctrine is fully enacted in the statement. Whoever takes upon himself the yoke of the Torah, they would remove from him. Catch this. They would remove from him the yoke of government. And the yoke of worldly concerns. And whoever breaks off the yoke of the Torah. So in other words, I don't want to follow under this rabbi anymore. Then all of a sudden, then you get placed back on. They place on him the yoke of government and the yoke of worldly concerns. The yoke of the Torah here presumably refers to the duty of devoting oneself to study. But yoke is used in a more specific and restricted sense. The proclamation of the unity of God by reading the Shema. It's called accepting oneself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. While the acceptance of the fulfillment of the commandments as a whole referred to in the second paragraph of the Shema is called accepting the yoke of the commandments. 
So accepting the yoke of heaven and then accepting the yoke of the commandments. Let's read the Shema if you have forgotten. This was the Jewish prayer back, found back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here's what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down. And when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What he's saying here is that that as he's contrasting the old life and he's saying that is not you, you know Christ. You know Jesus. You know his yoke. And what he's getting at here is it's more than. Yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I I said a prayer. Yeah, I, I got wet. What he's talking about is. A complete taking on of the yoke of Christ. All of his teaching. Everything that he is. And so Jesus uses the Shema and he puts it in a different way. He takes the Shema and he says it this way. He says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So he's saying that that was the old life. It was futile in thinking. It was darkened. It was given over to sensuality. But not you. You have been given Christ. And you have taken his yoke. And in doing so, you have received a new life. Assuming that you have heard about him. And that you were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, as we go to put on the new life, you and I remember that we have been freed from sin. Every chain has been broken. You are no longer a slave. And so what Paul is writing to this church and he's saying, if you are in the shadow of the temple to embrace the identity that Christ has given to you. You remember, it, it's in the first chapter. The first few paragraphs, you are, you are chosen. But many of us, though we are chosen, are still trying to be noticed by the temple. But many of us who are adopted are still trying to be accepted by others around us. You you have been redeemed. And yet many of us continue to carry shame and guilt. You have been forgiven. And yet many of us are still trying to make up for past sins. Grace has been lavished upon you. And yet many of us are still trying to earn favor from God. You and I, we have been given a purpose. And even though we have been given a purpose 
a role in the kingdom, we are still trying to gratify our flesh. We have been sealed. We have been marked. And yet many of us are still trying to earn the mark of the world. And so where he does here is he says that how we move in and put on the new life, the new self, is being renewed in the spirit of our minds. It sounds a lot like the Shema. It sounds a lot like the greatest commandment. What are you focusing on? Alsa says it this way. She Summarize this series in three phrases that we put on, we, we put off, we are renewed, and we put on. And I just want to be honest with you. That's hard. That's just hard. It just is. That as we, we lean into Christ, as we focus on the... It's still trying to get our attention. It's still trying to distract us. It's still trying to pull us in. It's still trying to, to say that it's the dominant factor in our... And that's our hope. That it's in that struggle that God continues to conform you to his image. So here's a question. As we're sitting down to coffee, eye to eye, knee to knee, and toe to toe, whose yoke are you trying to put on? Are you trying to to live yoked with Christ and also yoked with the world? Because if you are, it's not going to work. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be devastated. You're going to be torn. And rather than Christ giving you life, you will be destroyed. Because every time you step forward to follow Christ, you'll be looking over your shoulder at the world. And every time, lean into the world, you will be looking over your shoulder back at Christ. You can't have both. Paul is leaning in here to the church to say, yes, you are one in unity, diverse in function, built up in love. And you are different. You are different. Let me just ask you. If, if you were to give yourself an audit, however you want to do that, if you were to, to go and to sit down at the kitchen table and pull out a paper and say, what things have I given my heart to? What things have I given my soul to? What, what things have I given my mind to? What, what things have I given my strength to? How would the audit come out? That's hard. That, it's kind of hard to quantify your soul and your heart, right? I mean, that's, that's, so maybe in a more practical way, what if you did this? What if you said, of your free time, where am I spending my free time? 
What if, what if you said this? What about your talent? Where, where am I utilizing the gifts that God has given to me? What, what about this? What about your treasure? Where have I am I putting my treasure? Because I, I think that if you were to sit down, like seriously take the time to sit down and to offer up on those things, I think that after looking at that, you could see who your God is. And I would hope, I would hope that if you saw that living in the shadow of temple, that it was pulling you in, to that direction, back into your old life, that like Paul writes to, to, the, to the Galatians where he says that I moved my life back in line with the gospel, that you would fix that. G.K. Chesterton said it this way, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. If you were to to walk down the the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord and your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your might taking on the yoke of Christ. And these are the words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We we don't do that. I mean, that was fulfilled in Christ. But when we look, what about when you sit? What are you doing at mealtimes? What's the conversation like? What about when you walk? When you're, we don't walk many places nowadays, but we drive. What are you listening to? What are you filling your mind with? What are you allowing your heart to focus on? What has captured your heart? What about when you lay down before you go to bed? What about when you rise in the morning? It's interesting as, as we plan out a sermon series as we get together we discuss it we outline it and all that and this week as I was writing this I thought man this was you know seven verses I thought man I could have fit a lot more in there but then then as I leaned into it I thought man this is really going to be a heavy sermon and it is, you can feel it. Like there's a heaviness in the room. I don't know if it comes across on the TV, but man, it is heavy in this room today. And I think that's okay. Because the bottom line here that we're getting at is, is as Paul is saying, if you are going to be in the shadow of a temple, if God, you are going to be used in the temple, that, that there are times, there are moments that you have to stop and pause and examine your life and say, who am I living for? Am I living for the world or if I'm living for Christ? I think that's good. In fact, Paul talks about that throughout the New Testament to pause and to stop and to think about that. But here's why that's so important. Because we're different. And I think that if I were to talk to everybody in this world, in, in this room, probably the world too, but if I were to sit down with everybody in the room and say, how do you think things are going in the United States? I suspect that most of us would say terrible. Now, I don't know if that's God's perspective, but I suspect that if we were to sit down, talk, like, what's your view of Congress? What's your view of the president? Okay, and, if, and if we were to take it off of the national view and we were to say, you know what, let's, let's not look at the national view. What about your state? And some of the states we can see it's not going well because people keep moving out of them, right? But, <laughs> like, how's your baseball team? Like the Cubs. Oh, wait, they're all leaving too. Uh, I <laughs> Okay. 
But what if we were to sit down and say, like, how's your family going? Most of the time when I sit down with people over coffee or over lunch or something, it's like it, there's a train wreck going on. And it's a mess. And so our goal is not to mimic the solutions that the world has to offer. You see, many times what we're doing is that we're looking for worldly solution to spiritual problems and we're offering spiritual solutions to worldly issues. And so Paul gets us to to slow down and to say, this is what's happening in your life. You are part of this incredible, beautiful thing. And it's a mess and it's called the church. And, and as part of that church, the mechanism for the kingdom that, that Jesus established, that Jesus died for, this is what's happening in you. That you have left your old life. You picked up the, the yoke of Christ. And, and as you're focusing on Jesus, with your mind, the Spirit is transforming your life. And I wish I could tell you that you start at the bottom and you just go all the way up to the top and it's nice and smooth. But I'm here to tell you that, man, there are times where you take a step forward and it feels like you take three or four steps backward. But then you continue to focus on the gospel and you continue to focus on Christ and you continue and you see that even in those steps that you felt like were taking backwards, God was continuing to use those to sanctify you, to make you more and more like him. And that's pretty incredible when you think about it. It's hard, but it's incredible. And so we needed to spend some time to talk about that. And that's what we're talking about here, though. And, and as we imagine, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and they're going to sing, and we're going to receive communion. And we're going to have a baptism, which is really cool. But what's going to happen is that this is our message. It's an alternate way. Like, you don't have to live that way anymore. Like, our message to the world is like, you don't have to live in a darkened state. You don't have to live in the futility of your own thinking. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live where you're giving over to your sensuality over and over and over again. There is a way out, and his name is Jesus. And as you focus on him, on him, as you steady your mind on his spirit, his spirit gives you life and continues to transform you. And you begin to recognize that he gives life and hope. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing, and then we're going to receive communion. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. God, we thank you that you are a transforming power. That you don't leave us dead in our sins. That you sent your son Jesus who died for us. That you have given us the spirit. It's in his name we pray. Amen.